Okay, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel Hayden and uh, this is our first talk in the Great Lake Lecture Series. So I just put on here a slide behind a couple of the upcoming talks that you'll be able to see on our Facebook page and also uh, shared on Twitter so you can follow all the social media links as usual. And before we get started tonight I just wanted to give a quick thank you to the MSU uh, library here. We're using their digital scholarship library today, which is a 360 degree setup. Uh, so thank you to Terence and to Paul, who have really been instrumental in the technical setup of everything here today. Um, and also to the SAED uh, for the social media setup. So thank you to all of them. And also I'd just like to point out that we're doing this in a fully uh, COVID protected setup. So. Uh, no one else is here in the room with me right now, uh, and when we're outside, we're all wearing masks. I have my mask right here, and all staying more than six feet apart at all times. So, of course, safety uh, at this point is paramount. Okay, so uh, why are you all here today? So, I'm uh, Daniel Hayden, a professor here at Michigan State University, uh, and I'm going to be talking to you about mysteries and physics that we're researching at the LHC. Okay, so. Let's get started. So uh, when I'm not here at MSU or, or giving talks like I am now, uh, I'm often in Geneva in Switzerland, which is where my experiment is based, and we'll be talking about that uh, much more today. So here is a picture of me uh, with some colleagues on the ground uh, on the detector that we work on. Um, there's a 27 kilometer circumference tunnel underneath Geneva, Switzerland, uh, which accelerates protons very close to the speed of light. Uh, and that is the experiment that I work on, and we'll go into much more detail later today. But the best place to start is usually at the beginning. So uh, what am I going to be talking about today? So uh, I'm going to start with what are some of the big unanswered questions in physics today? Um, and then I'm going to go on to talk about what the Large Hadron Collider actually is, and how it, it can help us answer some of those questions. Why is it so special? And then at the end, I'm actually going to go on and talk about some real results uh, that we have at the LHC. Okay? So to try and answer some of these big uh, questions. Okay. So uh, some of you may be more or less aware um, that there are four known fundamental forces of nature that we know about. So there's uh, electromagnetism, which is one that uh, many people will be familiar with. So this explains electrons uh, going around atoms. It also explains the forces involved uh, when you pick up a piece of metal with a magnet, for example. So that's the force of electromagnetism. There's also uh, the weak interaction force, which is uh, the force that is uh, responsible for radioactive decays. So if you ever hear about you know, nuclear decays or radioactivity, this is usually to do with the weak force. Okay. Um, there's also something called the strong force, which uh, is what keeps protons and neutrons together in atoms. Okay, it explains how they can be held together. And then the one that most people are probably familiar with is gravity. So in this example here, an apple falling from the tree, or if you trip over, for example, everyone knows the force of gravity. So these four known fundamental forces of nature explain all of the interactions we know about on the everyday scale between particles and objects. Okay? And these are some of the fundamental forces that we're dealing with when we're doing the studies of the LHC. But let's go one step even further back and start talking about matter. Okay, So uh, again, one that most people is probably most familiar with uh, are elements. So you can think of, for example, you know, carbon or oxygen. All of the elements in the periodic table, as I've shown here, I always like this picture because it shows you know, uh, what all of these uh, elements are being used for. Okay? And there was a time when people thought, well, there was a time when people thought that the elements were like earth and fire and air, for example. And then we advanced in our scientific knowledge and we understood that materials are made of different elements, uh, such as those on this periodic table. And then it was discovered that these elements are actually just different combinations of particles called protons and neutrons and electrons orbiting around them. So if we take, for example, up here, oxygen, that has eight protons and eight neutrons, so we have an atomic number of 16. And the only difference with carbon, made in diamonds, for example, uh, would be to have six protons and neutrons. 
So they're different combinations of the same things. And for a time, we thought that protons and neutrons were fundamental particles. We couldn't break them apart into anything smaller until it was discovered that actually protons and neutrons are made of smaller stuff. They're made of quarks. So we then advanced to the understanding that a proton, for example, is two kinds of quarks called an up quark and a down quark. Okay? So all of the time as our scientific knowledge was advancing, we began to see smaller and smaller building blocks of nature. Okay? And so far that has ultimately culminated in this. Okay, apologies for that everyone. We had some technical difficulties, as can be the way uh, sometimes with these setups. And as we say, this is the first lecture in the series, so there'll be a few technical hiccups along the way. Okay, so uh, continuing on, I'll just give a little while, I can see people are reconnecting. Uh, so, uh, where was I? I was talking about the elementary particles of nature as we currently understand them. So we know about six types of quarks. Uh, we also know six types of leptons, so you'll be familiar with the electron, for example. Uh, but there are other kinds of leptons as well. And these constitute all of the matter particles that we know about in nature. Uh, and then we also know of four force-carrying particles, of which most people are probably familiar with the photon. Uh, and these transmit the forces of nature that we were just talking about on the previous slide. Okay? So, uh, what I'm about to show you now is uh, one of my favorite things in the world. I think these better, are better than fish tanks. And it's something called a cloud chamber. Uh, and actually, because when we talk about these fundamental uh, particles in nature, uh, you don't have a good sense of them because it's not something we can usually see with the naked eye. But a cloud chamber actually allows us to see these particles with our own eyes. So I'm going to play this video for you. And I actually made one of these with an undergraduate here at MSU. Um, and so what you can see are all of these little tracks being left, and these are being left by some of those fundamental particles. So the thin uh, lines you can see here are being left by electrons, usually, uh, and the thicker tracks are actually being left by a clump of protons and neutrons. Uh, it's a helium atom, a helium nucleus. And these are actually around us every second of every day. People usually think of radiation and uh, they get scared. But actually, there's small amounts of background radiation around us all day, every day, long before we were born and long after we're dead. There's this constant background level of radiation. Okay? I should try and play that again. And the way that we create this setup so that they can be seen is you have a thin layer of ethanol, uh, which is like the surface of a lake, and then you rapidly cool a vapor form of ethanol down onto the surface which creates kind of a super saturated layer so that when charged particles like electrons travel through it, it will ionize particles in the air and then clouds will condense onto the tracks that the particles have traveled along. So what we're actually seeing now are the paths left by some of these real particles, okay? So I think these are great and if you ever come uh, to a particle physics uh, show at MSU, then I'll try to break out a cloud chamber so we can show this and you can see it with the naked eye. We also have these at CERN, okay? So this is a very basic idea of how we can start to detect particles and see the paths that they travel, and that will become important later when we're talking about the LHC, okay? Okay, so let's talk about some of the big fundamental questions in physics at the moment, okay? So one is called the matter-antimatter asymmetry, uh, which is a question we have of uh, the amount of matter that we see in the universe. So where we are now, if this is the lifetime of the universe from the Big Bang out to present day. So here we are in present day with macroscopic materials and we've got solar systems and stars. But if we start to wind back time, you can think of from the original Big Bang, you can think as we wind back time, we're getting to a smaller and smaller, a hotter and hotter universe. And the earlier back we go, we start to get so energetic that no longer materials can hold together, it's only atoms are whizzing around. And we go back even further, and there's so much energy that not even the atoms can hold together, so we just have protons and neutrons and electrons. And if we get further and further back, you can think of this energy breaking up these particles into more and more fundamental particles. And actually, one of the reasons 
Uh, one of the reasons the LHC is special is because we're doing collisions which are close to the energy of a few milli or microseconds after the Big Bang. So we can get back to the energies that were around in this early time in the universe. Okay? And one of the reasons we want to do that is because uh, from this Big Bang, if you think of matter and antimatter, you may have seen from certain films, when matter and antimatter come into contact with each other, they should annihilate. Okay, so I've got just a, a silly little example. If I had a quark and an anti-quark, a particle and its antiparticle, and they come into collision with each other, they would instantly annihilate each other and just give off energy. Okay. In the same way, from the Big Bang, you would expect that nature would treat matter and antimatter equally. So from the Big Bang, you would expect matter to come out, but equally, uh, you would expect an equal amount of antimatter to also be released. Okay, so you think, okay, that's fine. But what do we observe when we look around the universe today? Okay. If there were equal amounts of matter and antimatter, you would have expected in the big mixing pot of the universe that after such a long uh, period of time, you would think that all of this matter and antimatter would have come back into uh, a collision with each other and there would just be energy everywhere. Where in reality, when we look out into the universe, we see this. So this is one of my favorite pictures of all time. It's uh, called Hubble Deep Field. And they, uh, they pointed the Hubble Space Telescope into a small patch of sky about as big as a postage stamp if you hold it up at arm's length a dark patch of the sky, and they left the telescope on a long exposure, um, and this is what they saw. Now, the first time I looked at this, I thought, okay, great, um, you know, lots of stars, but then someone told me that these aren't stars, these are galaxies, okay? And this just makes me realize how small we are in the universe, but for this purpose, it makes me realize how much matter is out there, okay? If, if there are 100 billion galaxies out there, and each of those galaxies have 100 billions of stars, then, you know, there is a lot of matter out there. So the question comes, what happened to all of the antimatter, okay? And this is a question that we're trying to uh, understand, why nature might treat matter and antimatter differently. So one of, uh, so a cartoon, you know, we think of ourselves doing these advanced experiments, um, but, you know, the further we go in science, the more questions we end up answering. So even a long time ago, people could have looked up at the stars and thought, you know, where the hell did it all come from? But even today, we amaze ourselves when we do these studies, uh, we see more and more in the universe, and we're still amazed even to this day. So. One of the ways that uh, we might be able to explain uh, matter and antimatter being treated differently in the universe is something called CP violation. So what do I mean by CP violation? So the C stands for charge, just a positive or a negative charge. So if we have an electron, okay, we know that that has a negative charge and it's a matter particle and the antimatter equivalent of the electron is called the positron and it has a positive charge. The same is true for the up quark, for example. It has an antimatter particle called the anti-up quark. And you can even have collections of particles. So the proton, for example, has, uh, the proton has an antiparticle called the antiproton. And all of the difference between these two is that the charge has been flipped, okay? The difference between matter and antimatter. And you might expect that the universe would treat matter and antimatter the same, okay? There's another kind of uh, symmetry that we uh, would expect in the universe, which is if you uh, hold up uh, some reaction, you know, if you struck a match in the mirror, for example, you would expect that your reflection of striking that match would do the same thing. Okay? So we expect in physics, generally, that the mirror image of a reaction would be the same. Okay? Um, but actually, as early as 1956, it was seen that some weak force, nuclear decays, actually did not obey this symmetry in the universe, okay? And it was thought that, okay, maybe parity is violated in some strange cases, but maybe charge and parity together would still be conserved. And it was actually found out that this also doesn't work. So there is something in nature that is treating uh, matter and antimatter differently, and we can study that at the LHC to try and understand why that might be the case, okay? So that's one big question in physics.
Uh, another question, and this one is closer uh, to what I work on, um, is the origin of mass. So a rather embarrassing thing uh, in particle physics is that uh, all of the equations that we had, uh, they all worked well talking about the interactions between electrons and other particles, um, but embarrassingly, none of them actually predicted uh, the masses of those particles. And of course, if we look around us, everything clearly has mass. So there must be some mechanism that uh, gives particles their mass. Okay? And in fact, when we empirically measure the masses of particles, we see that there's a vast variety of those different masses, down from uh, particles called neutrinos, uh, which uh, a big flux of those come from the sun and nuclear reactors, they have almost a zero mass as far as we can measure. That's actually a whole topic onto its own, trying to measure the mass of neutrinos. And then we look at particles like the up quark or the electron, which have small but non-zero masses. And in 1995, the quark called the top quark was discovered, which has a gigantic mass compared to all of the other fundamental particles we know about. And the embarrassing thing was that at the time, we did not know why these particles had their different masses. Okay? Um, so we had our picture here of the elementary particles of nature that we know about. Um, and in 1960, Peter Higgs, along with uh, a number of others, uh, formulated a theory that would enable the particles to obtain their masses. And uh, this was a theory of the Higgs field, okay, a field that permeates all space okay, um, and would allow particles to attain their mass. And one of the fundamental predictions of this, because we want to check if it turns out to be uh, real in nature, is that an excitation of that field would produce a new particle called the Higgs boson. So we could add a new particle to our zoo of particles here called the Higgs boson. But at the time, it was just a theory. Okay? So how would this Higgs field work exactly? So a cartoon I generally like to use is imagine that there's a party going on, okay? and all the people here are in the room, and there's someone at the door who can say when someone new is about to come into the room. Okay? And say that you know, I walk into the room, and I'm not famous in any way, so I could move through the room very relatively easily. People might say hi or so forth. But I could move through the room relatively easily, okay? And in this context, I wouldn't have much of a mass. If this was the Higgs field, and I wasn't interacting with the Higgs field very much, then I could move through the room very easily, and it would be the equivalent that I would have a very small mass. So maybe I would be an electron or a photon that doesn't interact at all. But now let's say that the person uh, is whispering into that Einstein is about to walk into the room, okay? Like the physics megastar, okay, or Mary Curie is about to walk into the room. And as they walk into the room, of course, everyone is going to want to talk to them, okay? You know, if it was Einstein, you say, okay, how did you come up with E equals MC squared? You know, you could ask many different questions. So people would be clumping around Einstein, trying to talk to them. And in that way, as Einstein was trying to maybe get to the bar or to the buffet table, uh, he would have a very hard time making it across the room. So in this analogy, Einstein would be the top cork. It would have a very large mass because he's interacting with the Higgs field here. Okay? So it's almost like making it more difficult to travel through. Okay? So this would be Einstein obtaining a mass. And then keeping with this analogy, so you could say, okay, so this is the Higgs field and this is the particle that is clumping around. So what is a Higgs boson in this context? So the Higgs boson would be an excitation of the field. Okay? So you can think of that as a rumor of who's about to come into the room and say Mary Curie is about to come into the room. So they're all whispering, I want to talk to Mary Curie and ask about this and so forth. So this excitation of the field would be a Higgs boson and is something that we would try and search for at the LHC. Okay? So this is another thing that we would look for. Okay. So the last big question I want to talk about today, before we go on to the LHC and some of the results, and this is something I work on directly, is the question of why is gravity so weak? Now, you might not think that gravity is that weak. As I said earlier, if you drop a glass off of a table and it smashes, you know, you might think that you know, it's, it's pretty strong. Or when you try and get up in the morning after a, a particularly late night, you might think that gravity is keeping you uh, down to the bed. But 
What we mean about weak when we talk about it in the context of, of physics is that all of the other forces of nature are just so strong compared to gravity that it makes us think that there's something different that we haven't understood. So let me try and explain it in a way that, that will make more sense. Okay? So you may not think about it, but when you uh, pick up a piece of metal with a small handheld magnet, we talked about the fundamental forces of nature earlier. That magnet is exerting the force of electromagnetism on that piece of metal. Okay? That's how you pick it up from the table, because that metal is attracted to the magnet. And you may not think about it, but what you're actually doing when you pick up that piece of metal is you're, uh, you're having a, a game of tug, and, a tug of war. Okay? So the, the magnet is tugging on the piece of metal trying to pick it up, and the entire gravitational pull of the Earth is trying to pull the piece of metal back down again. And as you probably know, when you pick up small pieces of metal with a magnet, the magnet wins every time. Okay? So how can something so small beat the gravitational pull of the entire Earth? And the answer is because gravity is relatively so weak compared to the other forces. And this is an area of physics we call exotic physics because to answer this question, you could uh, come up with some very interesting uh, ideas which might seem out there, but the mark of a good theory is that it has a testable hypothesis that we can then check against. And one of the possibilities that it could explain for this is something called extraspatial dimensions. So what do I mean by that? So we live in a three, as far as we know, three dimensions of space. So I can move in the X direction, forwards and back. I can move in the Y direction, side to side. Or I could move in the Z direction, up and down. And of course, those spatial coordinates are moving in time, second after second, minute after minute. But there's nothing in nature that tells us that there should be only three spatial dimensions. Okay? Um, there could be very large extra dimensions. I mean, on the, on the scale of solar systems or even on the you know, very, very large uh, distance scales. Or there could be distance scales very, very small uh, that we're not aware of. Okay? So one way to think about the small extra dimensions would be the equivalent here of a person walking on a tightrope. So a person walking on a tightrope here, balancing as they go, can obviously only move in one direction. They can only move forwards or backwards if they don't want to fall off. Okay? Whereas if you zoom in to the very, very small scale, you would be able to see maybe a flea on that same rope, and the flea, being so small, would be able to crawl around the rope. Okay? So you could imagine them moving in another dimension. And that's exactly what we mean, that these extra dimensions could be very small. There could be other dimensions that we just haven't probed yet. And this is a part of why using the LHC is important, because higher energies actually translate to smaller distance scales and would allow us to probe these extra dimensions if they existed. So how would that explain the weakness of gravity, even if there were these extra dimensions? So uh, this comes into uh, a mathematically complex area of physics called brain theory, B-R-A-N-E brain theory, and the theory would go that everything we know and love would exist on one three-dimensional brain here, okay? So this is represented as a 2D plane, but imagine that it's everything we know about here, okay? And this is where the forces of nature, such as electromagnetism and so forth, reside, and we feel their strong, uh, the, we feel their strong effects. And then you can imagine through the small extra dimensions, okay, there may be another brain okay, somewhere else in this higher dimensional space, and on that brain is where gravity resides, and on that brain gravity is just as strong as the other forces of nature. But then because of this extra dimensional link, okay, and I'm not talking about parallel universes and other people living in them, you know, I'm just mean... Uh, for another uh, force at this, uh, on this other brain, that you could then imagine the force of gravity leaking through these small extra dimensions into our three-dimensional brain, almost like a watering can effect. So we don't feel the full force of gravity, we just feel a, splink, a sprinkling effect of gravity, and that would explain why it's so weak compared to the other forces. Okay. So again, you know, you could say that this sounds like a crazy idea, but theorists uh, would work through the maths 
relate it back to uh, everything we currently know. And the key is that they have to make predictions. And one of the predictions from this is that there would be another new particle called the graviton. Okay, And that's a particle which we can search for at the LHC to say whether this theory was true or not. Um, so I can come back to this slightly later just because we lost a little bit of time. But the idea I wanted to convey here is that these four fundamental forces of nature that we talked about earlier, in our time now, our energy scale in the universe, we see them as four separate fundamental forces. Okay? But as you go back in time and you get to higher and higher energies in the universe, we know from previous experiments that these two forces, the electromagnetic and the weak force, actually combine together into a single force known as the electroweak force. Okay? Um, and so the prediction is that at higher energy scales, you might expect the other forces of nature to also combine so that at the earliest time of the universe, essentially when the Big Bang happened, that there was just one unified force in nature. Now this is just a theory and uh, you know, there are many different versions that would make it work or might not make it work, but the, an observation of graviton would also be a sign that there was this unification of the forces involving gravity at very high energy scales. So that's why it's something that's extremely sought after, but it's so difficult that the theories uh, around it uh, are ones that, uh, you know, we need lots of evidence before we would believe in such a thing, okay? Okay, so as I say, one of the predictions of this would be that there would be another particle called the graviton, which we would also observe at the LHC, okay? So now we're coming to the, the part where we have uh, what we currently understand in physics, our standard model, and we have some predictions of some new particles that we want to find to know if these other new theories are true, okay? So how do we do that? Well, enter the Large Hadron Collider, which is based in CERN in Geneva, Switzerland. So this is an aerial photograph of the area surrounding CERN, and you can see hopefully on the screen there a red line here. So this is a tunnel that is 27 kilometers in circumference. Okay, so you can see uh, the Alps in the background here, uh, and the airports, for example, for scale. So you, just to give you an idea of how large this tunnel is, which is around 100 meters underground. And we have, uh, so this is a picture of that tunnel underground as well. So I think someone's ridden a bike around there a long time ago, that would take a long time for 27 kilometers. At least it would take me a long time. Um, and we have four main experiments. So we have an experiment called LHCB, one called CMS, ALICE, and ATLAS. And these essentially act as massive digital cameras that try to record the collisions that we produce. So we accelerate protons around these rings in opposite directions at 99.99999% of the speed of light. So very, very high energy. And we collide them together at these points to try and uh, work out what happened in the collisions and search for these new particles. Now, these uh, are the different experiments. I work on an experiment called the ATLAS experiment, okay, which we'll talk a little bit more about today. And you may have heard, in the context of the Large Hadron Collider, you may have heard about CERN. So CERN here, the CERN site here, is where everyone has meetings and talks to each other, also hosts a number of other experiments uh, besides the LHC. Okay? So, um, as I say, this, that was an aerial view, but rather than try and get these tunnels and experiments to go over and under hills and so forth, um, this is actually built all 100 uh, meters or so underground, so you have to take a long lift to get down to these experiments. And the reason we do that is because these digital cameras that we're talking about to, to sense these collisions are very sensitive, and we want to not get any false signals maybe from cosmic rays that could come through and enter our detector. We want to have a very clean background. And also, if you're going to dig a 27-kilometer tunnel, it's probably easier to do it underground than on the surface. Okay? And actually, to get these protons up to speed, we need many other smaller accelerators to step-by-step step get these protons up to very close to the speed of light. So I've got an animation to kind of give you a bit more of a, an active visual sense of what I'm talking about here. Um, first of all, let me just uh, show you what the Atlas detector looks like. So the beams of protons would come in from either side of this picture here, and we try and collide it in the very center. So to give you an idea of how big this detector is, 
It's, uh, as you can see here, it's got 44 meters in length and 22 meters in diameter, okay? So it's about as big as Notre Dame, and it weighs over 7,000 tons, okay? Which still blows my mind. In fact, to get it to fit into the underground cabin, they had to bow the floor upwards so that the weight of it would make it sit flat. That's how heavy it is. It's, it's around as heavy as the Eiffel Tower, to give you a comparison. And you can see some people down here, um, they're so small they probably don't show up on the feed for a visual representation. And all of this, uh, you know, I'm a physicist, but really this is an engineering feat, okay? Engineers are just important, just as important in this field to be able to build machinery that all of these components are within micrometers of precision with each other. And if that didn't work, we wouldn't be able to see these collisions as accurately as we do. So really, as well as physicists, as engineers, planning, construction, all of this coming together as a scientific achievement, okay? So we bring the, the uh, protons into collision at the center, and I think the best way to show you is through an animation here. So this is the tunnel. We have bunches of protons coming from both directions, and as they enter the Atlas detector, we very finely tune it so that they will collide right at the center, and then you can imagine as the protons collide, all of the particles and energy that come out from that collision well, I talked about the Atlas detector as like a digital camera, so you can think of these as pixels almost on your screen, and for all of the particles that come out, we would be able to measure their energy and their direction. And from that, we can use computer algorithms to work back what happened in that collision and if we created any uh, new particles. So we have a prediction, I'll run it again, just why I'm doing this, we have a prediction about what we would see from all the physics we know, and then theorists also uh, tell us what we should expect to see if some of this new physics was also present, and we can compare those simulations to the real data that we take at the LHC, okay? So, um, yeah, this, and we're not just doing single collisions. People think, okay, we do a few collisions, we discover the Higgs boson and we're done. There are over a million collisions a second at the LHC that we do. So we need to take vast quantities of data to be able to find these small signals of new physics. So if you imagine the Atlas detector as a barrel, and we're looking down the barrel now, so your protons are going into the screen here, okay? That, that small dot there is the protons going into the screen, and you can imagine a collision happening. And I'm just looking like at a segment of the detector, and you can see all of these fundamental particles that we were talking about earlier, like the electron and the muon and so forth, and then particles made of, of, of quarks, such as the proton and the neutron. Now, depending on what kind of signatures they leave, we can then compute, use computer algorithms to work out what particles they were. So the proton and the neutron have much larger masses, so they will penetrate further into our detector. And we can tell whether it's charged or, or has no charge, whether it leaves a track, whether this is a proton or a neutron. The electron and the photon are much uh, lighter, much lower overall energy, so they will be stopped sooner in the detector. And again, as an electron is charged, it will leave a track all the way and stop in this part of the detector, whereas a photon has no charge, it will leave no track, and then it will stop. So you can think back to the, pic the video I showed you of the cloud chamber, and that we were uh, visually seeing uh, these uh, tracks, well, we can do the same with computer algorithms to work out what particles we are seeing. Okay? Um, so, um, when we do these collisions at the LHC, uh, theorists don't just tell us, um, you know, uh, that we should expect to see the particle, we also have an idea of what kind of signatures they would leave in the detector. So, if we created a Higgs boson, for example, then uh, it could decay to two Z particles, and further decay to electrons and muons, okay? And then we would therefore look for a few of those signatures in the detector, okay? Um, and there's something called Feynman diagrams, which is kind of a shorthand for this rather than showing you a picture. Uh, I don't know if you've seen these diagrams before, but it basically tells you, uh, so a famous physicist Richard Feynman came up with these, um, so that you can see the kind of particles that would come uh, from different decays and through mathematics principles you can work out what is possible. So this would be one way to look for a Higgs boson. We'd look for two electrons and two muons in the detector at the end. 
Um, but actually there are many different ways to look for a Higgs boson. We don't just look in one way, we look in many ways. So it could decay to two quarks, B quarks specifically, and this is how it decays predominantly. And it could decay into many other kinds of particles as well. And so to believe that we have discovered a new particle, we want to observe it in multiple ways to really check that it is the particle that we think about. Okay? Uh, this is just an example of a real event. Okay, so this is uh, really what we look at sometimes when we look at the data we've collected. And again, we're looking down the barrel of the Atlas detector here. Um, and so from this, I can tell, because it's got two tracks and leaves two energy deposits around here, that these would be two electrons. And that isn't one of the decays that we talked about for the Higgs boson, but it is something that the graviton is predicted to decay to. So the graviton could decay to these two particles. Okay? Okay. So I'm going to give you a quick explanation of the results. I know we're going a little bit over time now, but as we had a drop in the feed, I guess we'll just go 10 minutes longer. Um, so uh, just to give you a quick explanation of some of the results that I'm about to show you, because I'm about to show you some real results from the LHC. Okay? So I'm going to show you some plots, some graphs, where the x-axis is going to be the mass or the energy of the collisions that took place. Okay? Either we take the two electrons and add them back together and worked out what the mass of that particle would have been, or if it was two electrons and two muons, we do the same. It's like you know, if you had a car crash and trying to work out what happened in the original collision, okay? trying to work back from there. So if I do a collision of two protons, and I work out that it has a certain energy, maybe it has the same mass energy equivalent of a brick, for example. So when I do that one collision, I would then fill an entry in my graph here. But I said we don't just do the collision once, we do it many times. So as I collect data, I would see that each time I have these protons colliding, maybe they don't hit head on, maybe they slightly glance off each other, and I will get different energies uh, over time. So as I take more and more data, I'm building up this distribution okay, of, uh, of data. And we can compare that to our simulation of what we expect to see. And if the data disagrees with our simulations, then that might mean that we've discovered new physics. Okay? So the y-axis here is just going to be the number of times we observe it, and the x-axis is going to be the mass or the energy of that collision. Okay? So be prepared for a very colourful plot on the next slide. So this is a search for the graviton decaying to two electrons. And again, it looks more complicated, but all of these little blocks here are just bins of different mass going up to higher and higher energy as we go to the right. And you can see here that this is, tens of, this is a million here. So you can see just in this bin, there's over two million entries to get an idea of how many collisions we do at the LHC. All of these colored boxes here are what comes from our prediction of what there should be with all of the physics we currently know about. And the black points are what we actually record with real collisions at the LHC. And then at the bottom here, you can see a ratio between what we expect and what we see. Now, you can see that it depends, you could say, fortunate or unfortunate, but actually our data is agreeing with our predictions very well. If a graviton were to be present in nature, then we would expect to see a bump in the data, so the black, the black dots should follow these peaks here if we were to discover a graviton. And this was back in 2013, and I can show you a plot that was just taken uh, with all of the data up to 2018. You can see that the data is very well following this line and is not following uh, the peak that would be indicative of a graviton. So we can't say that a graviton certainly doesn't exist in nature, but we can say that we have not discovered the graviton yet. Okay, so now let's change and go to the Higgs boson, okay? So now I'm going to show you an animation of collecting data. So again, the colored histograms are what we expect from nature, and the black points are what we record. And you can see the dates changing here back in 2012 when this animation was made. And as we're collecting more data, this histogram is filling up more and more and putting more and more blocks in. But look what's happening over here. There's an excess in the data which isn't predicted by everything we knew at the time. And if we put in what the prediction of a Higgs boson would look like, you can see that it matches almost perfectly what that excess in the data looks like. Okay? 
So this was strong evidence that we had discovered the Higgs boson. But this was just in one channel. This was looking at uh, two electrons or two muons, which is the diagram I showed you earlier. Now remember, there are many other ways that the Higgs could decay as well. So uh, this is a result that shows you all of the other measurements. One on this axis is uh, consistent with, this, with a Higgs boson, okay? And you can see all of these different channels, two B quarks I talked about earlier, the four leptons, and uh, they were all agreeing with the existence of Higgs boson. So we got to a point where uh, we call it five sigma, five standard deviations, where we were confident enough to claim a discovery of the Higgs boson back in 2012. Okay, so in the last few minutes, I'm going to go through one more answer. So uh, we asked the question right back at the beginning about the matter-antimatter asymmetry in the universe. Um, and that will go to an, another one of the experiments, the LHCb experiment. Okay, um, And this is an asymmetric detector, so it's no longer like a barrel. You can see that all of the particles, as we're looking at here, are going forward. So it looks at... at, at, at uh, at particles that are very close to where the beam line is going. So if the beam was going through here, the protons, okay? So uh, let's take a look again, just a quick recap for matter and antimatter. So we talked about protons at the beginning being made of two up quarks and a down quark, okay? And equally, uh, a neutron and, uh, is also made of one up quark and two down quarks. And if I talk about the antimatter equivalent of those particles, the antiproton and the antineutron, then the antiproton is just made of two anti-up quarks and an anti-down quark, and an antineutron is just made of its antimatter counterparts as well. Okay? So these are the particles that we know about in everyday nature. But actually, there are other combinations of particles, uh, like protons and neutrons, that are made of different quark contents. Okay? And ones, uh, some of the ones that the LHCb is looking at specifically is something called B mesons. I'll stand on this side at the beginning. So B mesons are, uh, are mesons. They're made of two quarks. But you can see here they're made of different kinds of quarks, not the usual ones we find of up and down quarks. They're made of a strange quark and a bottom quark. So the matter particle is made of a strange and an anti-bottom quark. And the antimatter particle is made of an anti-strange and a bottom. So you would say, okay, why is that important? So the reason this is interesting for our question of matter-antimatter asymmetry is that when you create a matter B meson, there is some process at which it can actually decay to as antimatter particle, the uh, the anti-B meson. Okay, and equally, the anti-B meson also has a probability that it can decay back to its matter particle. And if we expect that nature is treating matter and antimatter equally, then you could measure the number of times that matter turns to antimatter with these particles and the number of times that antimatter turns to matter. And if this ratio of the number of times it happened was one, you would know that nature treated matter and antimatter equally. And even though it had been observed in other processes, it had actually never been observed before 2013 in these kind of B mesons. So a result from uh, LHCb uh, back at the time was that to 99.69999% uh, certainty or a statistical uh, precision of 5.8 standard deviations, they found this ratio was not equal to 1. So again, in these, new, in these other kinds of particles, they had observed CP violation okay, that we talked about earlier. But even though we had observed CP violation, that still does not answer the question of why nature treats these particles differently. And that is ongoing studies at the LHC to try and probe some of these. Now it's been observed, but the finer we can measure the CP violation, the more we might be able to understand the underlying mechanism in nature of why this is the case. So LHCb, this is the last uh, two slides, the LHC, LHCb is actually pointing at more hints of new physics as well, not even beyond this. So um, with other kinds of uh, B mesons that involves uh, a couple of electrons or a couple of muons in the final state, you don't need to understand this plot extremely well, but everything uh, we know from our simulations would expect electrons and muons in these decays to be treated equally. But actually, what we measure in data is far away from that, okay? 
And if we look at the angular decay, the directions that these particles move in, again, these orange boxes are what we would predict from our current theories, and the data is showing something very different. So this might be pointing us, literally as you're seeing it now, to signs of new physics that we have to include. And one of the ideas of what these things can be pointing towards is something called leptoquarks, which I didn't even talk about at the beginning. But we started this talk talking about the elements of the periodic table, and that over time we understood that those elements are made of protons and neutrons. And then we discovered that protons and neutrons are made of smaller particles. And I presented you with this particle zoo of particles with the leptons and the quarks. Okay? And this is where our current understanding is that they're indivisible. They can't be broken up into anything smaller. But who says that that has to be the case? Okay? There's nothing in nature that says this has to be the end of the story. So it could be a possibility that uh, other particles... Uh, are making up these quarks and leptons, some fundamental building block that's even smaller than these particles. And the evidence we've seen before could be pointing at something called leptoquarks, which is a kind of particle that would let quarks and leptons change into each other. Okay? So I'll leave you that, with that thought, and if some of these things excite you, then you know we need more people to help us in this research. So physics always needs you. So thank you very much, and sorry for the technical glitch uh, at the beginning there. Uh, I'll leave this up for the future talks, and I think uh, Lias has taken some questions from the audience. He's going to shout in from the door. Yeah, and if you want to put the mask so I can please you at the same room. Yeah, yeah, and then I'll take it off when I talk. Okay. Uh -huh. So first question from Merrick Blavinsky. He asks, or she asks, or they ask, so would gravitons then leak from these pores between the brain, brains, and would we detect them coming from these tiny connections? Yeah, so a very good question from Marek, I think was the name, Marek or Marek. Okay. Uh, I'll just repeat the question here. So the question was, uh, would we be detecting these gravitons coming from the extra dimensions? Um, and would they be leaking through? So, um, in answer to your question, there are, there are multiple theories on, on how this would work. Uh, there are some theories that actually in the proton-proton collision we would be creating the graviton, but it could quickly disappear into the extra dimension, um, so we would see a, a lack of energy in the detector, so we could create it directly. Um, the problem is that these extra dimensions um, are so small that we don't see these gravitons um, directly leaking through as we do now. Uh, you feel the force of gravity, but the amount of gravitons that corresponds to is very, very small. So at the LHC, we would, we would be directly trying to create them because we're going back to an energy scale where uh, gravity would be stronger and so the interactions would be high. We would be able to create gravitons more readily than we observe them at our everyday level. So they're not really... Uh, the ones we detect are not leaking through. They're leaking through every second now that we're feeling the force of gravity, if that is the correct theory. So at the LHC, we, we, we would be directly creating the gravitons. Okay. Okay. Uh, next question from Mary Lordi. And the question is, is the LHC the same as the collider in Illinois? Okay, so Mary asked the question, another, another very good question, is the collider in the LHC the same one as the collider in Illinois? So that's a very good question. So uh, the collider in Illinois is actually the predecessor to the LHC, okay? So it's called the Tevatron, and this uh, was an energy that was about around uh, 10 times smaller than the energy that were colliding protons at, at the LHC. So many great discoveries were made at the Tevatron, um, but we needed to build an even bigger ring, and all of the particle physics community in the world essentially got together and built the LHC, which is the next upgrade from the Tevatron, and in the future we even talk about building an even bigger collider to get to higher energies, um, so we can continue this quest. So they are not the same collider, but many of the people who worked on the Tevatron also work on the LHC. Some of those very prominent people are also are members of Michigan State University. Okay. Um, one more question from Kevin Krause. 
The question is, uh, how does LHC compare to AFRIM or FRIM here at MSU? Yeah, very good question. So uh, from, was it Frank? Did you say the question was from? Uh, Kevin Krauss. Kevin Krauss, sorry. So thank you very much for the question, Kevin. Kevin was asking, uh, how does the LHC compare to FRIB, uh, which is this fantastic facility that we have here um, uh, at MSU? And actually, uh, just to plug, there will be a talk by Artemis later in this series um, about uh, her research is included in EFRIB. So the difference here is that the LHC, we're trying to deal at the particle level with individual particles, elementary particles that we're colliding together, where I think the, the focus of what they're doing at EFRIB is looking at materials. They are colliding particles and breaking those apart and doing studies. I'm not an expert on this area, but they're dealing with you know, atoms and larger materials and the research associated with those. Whereas uh, my main task in the, for the LHC is we're trying to find new fundamental building blocks of nature. Okay? Uh, I think uh, we have time for one or two more questions, maybe? Uh, yes. Well, there's a question that we got on Twitter. And the question is, uh, what will happen if someone walks into the cloud chamber? Okay, <laughs> so what will, what will happen if someone walks into the cloud chamber that I showed at the very beginning? Uh, so the good news is, apart from getting a little bit wet uh, from uh, um, the ethanol that you would be soaked in, uh, there would not be no danger to you, um, because as I said at the beginning, these particles are around you every second of every day, traveling through us, uh, you know, uh, doing no harm to us at all. So those particles will be there whether we view them or not. Uh, the only thing that that cloud chamber was doing was allowing us to see those particles with the naked eye. So apart from getting a little bit wet, you would be fine. Okay, so I think that's all we have time for today. So thank you very much for those who could join. And again, apologies for the small technical glitch uh, at the beginning. Uh, and thank you again to uh, the DSL lab here at the Michigan State uh, Library and also to Elias for all of the social media contacts. Again, please tune in. in it's every two weeks at this time at 7 o'clock on Thursday. Uh, during the spring, we'll be having different uh, and exciting talks. So thank you very much, and we'll speak to you all soon. Okay, bye-bye.